Hello and welcome to episode six of Think Big with Michael Zellner. All positive, no politics. Today, I'd like to welcome my guest, Will Wade. Will was the head coach at UT Chattanooga from 2013 to 2015. He coached at Virginia Commonwealth University from 2015 to 2017 and at LSU from 2017 to 2022. Will, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excited right. to be here. Ah, I appreciate you coming on today. So, well, tell us something about yourself that most people don't know. Well, um, I'm on a run streak. Um, I've been on a run streak for over seven years now. I started uh, when I was a head coach at Chattanooga, so I've run at least uh, a mile a day uh, for over seven, uh, going on seven and a half years now. So my goal was to make it to 10 years. So I got about, got about two and a half years, uh, left. Uh, most days I run, you know, three plus miles, but, um, wow. um, you know, I've, I've, uh, I kind of started that and it's been, uh, it's been, uh, been good for me, but, uh, they say you can't outrun a bad diet. I still don't eat well enough to, to show <laughs> the, uh, to show the, uh, the, um, the, the hard work paying off, but, uh, yeah, I've been on a run streak for about seven and a half years. How did you get started with that? Actually, a guy in Memphis, Greg Graber, got me uh, got me started on it. He uh, he worked with our team on mindfulness and breathing techniques at Tennessee Chattanooga, and he said, "Why don't you start this with me?" He he was already on one, and then he uh, you know he dropped out about two years in. He could he couldn't hang. <laughs> and, uh, but he got me started on it. It just, it was a good way to start my day. I do it every, I, I run early in the morning. So I do it the first thing every morning. I have like a panic attack. If I haven't had my run by like seven 30 or eight in the morning, like I have a panic attack, like the day's not going to go well. So, um, I, st I started out, uh, every morning. It's a good way to clear my mind, good way to get my, get myself, uh, get myself going for the day and, and, and process things and think through things. And, Sometimes I listen to music. Sometimes I listen to podcasts. Sometimes I, you know, I just, I, I can just get a lot of things, uh, a lot of things done. But yeah, I started it because Graber uh, challenged me to, to, to start it. And, and um, I, uh, I've kind of taken it, uh, I've taken it from there, but it's been, it's been really, really good for me. That's amazing. So over seven years doing that. I can't even imagine that. It's not easy when you go overseas. I've had a couple of times where, you go overseas or when you take red eyes and, you know, there's, there's some of the days that have been, um, I had COVID. I ran during COVID a couple of times. Oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, I probably shouldn't, I can say that now that I'm good and the doctors are, are, are done with it, but you know, so, you know, I've, I've I, uh, I kept it going through a lot of different, a lot of different, a lot of different things. And, and, uh, it's been, uh, so like I said, it's been good to center me and ground me and it's, it's been a good, been a, been a good thing. That's, that's really awesome. So, you know, Will, you grew up in Nashville and you went to Franklin Road Academy and you started off as a student manager on the basketball team at FRA. And then again, you did the same thing at your alma mater at, at Clemson. Now, I know your mother, Margaret, was a basketball coach and was actually the first woman to be inducted into the National Hall of Fame. But how and why did you start coaching? Well, I never had a grand plan to to coach in uh, to coach in college, my my initial idea was just um, my my degrees in secondary education, history and geography. I was going to be a high school history teacher, coach and uh, co co coach in high school, and uh, you know I, I got into co you know when you're when you're the son of a teacher. My mom was a principal and uh, a, a teacher for a long time. It's kind of in your blood. I think most teachers have a relative or or a direct family member that was that was a teacher as well. And, um, you know, so I, I just, uh, that's how I initially started. And then, you know, once I went to Clemson and I, I got into grad school and was a graduate assistant on the college side, I really just ended up, ended up staying on the college side. But the reason I got in was the same. You want to affect people's lives. You want to help guys out. You want to help people get where they, where they, um, where they couldn't go without, you know, without your guidance or, or nudging or help. And so, you know, whether you're doing it, you know, in, in high school and college and the pros, wherever it may be, you know, a lot of the same skills apply, whether it's basketball, whether it's business, whether it's, you know, whatever it may be, some of the best business people could run a basketball program. Some of the best basketball people could run a, a you know, a business. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of crossover uh, in all that with the teaching and, 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 and leadership stuff. Um, you know, you worked as an assistant for Shaka Smart at VCU for four years. In fact, I, th I think you were his first hire when you got, when he got the job there and you helped 
you know, lead them to the final four in, in 2011. And Chaka Smart once said about you, no one will spend more time building relationships with student athletes than will. Uh, so many of the players that you coach over the years talk about how much they just love playing for you. Uh, isn't that one of the most rewarding parts of being a coach? Well, I've, yeah, I was very fortunate to, to get on with Shaka. He, he's had a, uh, a huge um, impact on my on my career. And, and like I said, I mean, the reason you do it is for the people. It's for the players. And, and look, does every player that played for me love me? No. Does every player? But but they know that, you know, they know that my heart was in the right place. I care for them. And I did try to invest uh, a ton of time. And, you know, some of my mistakes were I tried to probably changed too many kids. I took some risks on some kids and I thought I could, could, could really love them up and help them and change them. And I, and I, and I couldn't, and there's a, but there are a lot of them that, that, that I have been able to do that with and help. And, um, you know, obviously I was fired from LSU and one of the most rewarding parts of that, I know this is going to sound weird. There's not much rewarding about getting fired is I heard from a ton of former players and some of them, uh, you know, I, I stay in touch with a lot of them and, and some of them I hadn't, heard from in, in, you know, three, four, five years and for them to reach out and, you know, thank me for the impact, you know, that, 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 that I've been able to reconnect with probably uh, five or six guys uh, that, that, that I just hadn't had as much, you know, I'd talk to them maybe once a year, but now I talk to them, you know, every, every week or every other week. And so that's, that's been rewarding, but I mean, look, your best, you win with people, no matter what you're doing, no matter what, sport your coach and business you're in it's all about it's all about the people and can you get those people to believe in you believe in what you're doing and the only way to do that is to invest in them and you've always got to um you know I always talked about you know we got to make their selfish desires fit within our team needs and so you know how can you do that you've got to invest in them figure out what they are looking for out of it and then see how you can fit that into the greater good of what you're of what you're att attempting uh, to, to accomplish, but it's all about the people. I tell our player, I tell our staff that all the time. I tell anybody, guys, it's about our players. Nothing else matters, but our players. And, and I was fortunate. Not only do we have great players, we had great managers. We had great graduate assistants. We had great assistants. Like we had really, really good people. And that's how we were able to, to have some, uh, to have some success. But if you don't invest in the people, that's your most valuable commodity. And that's the way I looked at it. And Every day we tried to invest in those in those players, our managers, our trainers, everybody. You know, that that was that was my goal was to spend as much time with them as we could. What do you think is the most important thing that you teach players besides basketball? Well, I think uh, a work ethic is the most important thing. You know, I, I, we, we tried to really, really harp on you know, you know what a good day's work. I didn't have a bunch of team rules. I wasn't a guy who, I worked for a guy who always told me never rule yourself out of winning. So I never had, I never was like, I had a ton of team rules and our one, our, my, my one thing was show up on time and give great effort. And I think if you do that in anything that you do, if you're on time, which shows that you got respect for the other guy. And, you know, just like on this podcast, we started five, 10 minutes early. We were both on time. There's respect. We were, you know, we were ready to go. Right. Um, but but if you're on time and then give great effort, you know what good looks like and whatever you're doing, whether in our case, whether that was academics, whether that was preparation on the court, whatever it may be. But if, it, you know, if you show up on time and you give great effort, everything else is going to take care. Everything else is going to take care of itself. And so a lot of that comes down to having a good work ethic and, and, and having and having that sort of thing. But I think if, if if you know, if if guys can leave your your situation with knowing how to be on time all the time, knowing how to give great effort, knowing how to work. That translates in anything that you do. That translates in basketball. That translates in business. That translates with your family, you know, whatever it may be. Um, I think that, I think that that translates across a lot of different, a lot of different modicums. What is the most important thing that you learned from Shaka Smart? You know, he was the really spending the time with the players um, I, 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 I spent, you know, you, you pick up different things from everybody that you work for, but his ability to relate to players, his ability to um, spend time with them and get them to play hard for him was something I really, uh, really, really admired. And, and at the time, I didn't appreciate it nearly as much as I did when I became a head coach. Um, you know, at the time, I thought, guys, hey, wasting this time in his office with this kid, we could be 
you know, talking about, you know, and, you know, the ball screen didn't matter if you couldn't get the guy to care about some of the other stuff. And so I was more worried about how we're going to guard the ball screen or how we're going to do this or do that. Well, and, you know, Chaka taught me that don't matter if, if the guy's not, you know, not in the right mental space to, to, um, to, uh, to do it right. He would meditate with the guys in his office. And I just thought it's funny. I was, I'd think this is crazy. Why is he in there meditating? This is nuts. And two years later, I've got a meditation guy and we're meditating and I meditate every day, you know? And so now it's like, it's like, what? It's like, this is crazy. Right. Um, so I, I picked up a ton of stuff with him just in terms of how you, you value the players, how you, how you handle the players, deal with the players and, and make sure that, that you're doing everything you can to, to, to serve them and, and help them grow and help them. He used to say, we need to move them forward every day, even if it's just a half inch, like we've got to move them forward every day. You get hired at UT Chattanooga at the young age of, of just 30 years old at a division one university. What was that like for you? Well, I was uh, very, very fortunate. I had AD David Blackburn that, that, that put his neck out there and, 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 um, and, and, and hired me and, and Chattanooga is a great job. Um, you know, the previous coach had done a really good job. John Schulman, he'd just been here a long time and kind of got, you know, a little worn out with it at the end. And, um, you know, the program was, was in really, really, um, good spot. We had good players and, um, you know, at the, you know, I was just really, we made a lot of mistakes at Chattanooga. You look back, it's funny, the, um, some of the players I talk to them still all the time. There's one of them I talk to almost every day. And, uh, you know, they, some of the stories they tell, I just want to cover my head. I'm like, Oh no, that really didn't happen. I don't <laughs> think that was, I don't think it was quite like you remember, but really at Chattanooga, we just went so hard that we made things work. Even when we made a bunch of mistakes, even if I made the wrong decision or even we just went so hard at it and I had a great staff. Um, I had really, really good people. Wes Long's at, at, um, middle Tennessee. Now Brooks Savage is at, is at Wake Forest. Turner Battle was at Middle Tennessee. He's going into, um, he's going to be a principal up in Buffalo, I believe. Um, and so I, I had, and, and I had Casey Long, who's now at LSU. And I mean, I had really, really, uh, really, really good people. Alex Warden, who worked for me for a long time, and he's now with FCA. So we had good people. We were all young. We were all hungry. And like I said, we made a lot of mistakes, but we went so hard. A lot of times those mistakes kind of corrected themselves out and we were able to, to, to force feed it to work a little bit. You know, you, you built a lot of excitement back in that program at UT Chattanooga. And after a few years there, Shaka Smart, he gets hired at Texas and uh, you get the job to take over VCU. That had to be pretty exciting to go back there. Yeah, it's a tremendous, I mean, VCU is a tremendous, tremendous place. Um, great passion, great fans, great program. Um, you know, they've been good for a long time. Jeff Capel, I mean, they, Matt, Martin, right. they, they've had a lot of really, really good coaches. Mike Rhodes has obviously kept it kept it going and so they, they've been um you know they've been really really good for a long time so i was i was i was very excited uh, i was very very excited to, to to get the job from chattanooga and um you know it was tough following following coach smart he had done such a such a great job not only i mean you know a lot of times you know you go to a final four to school like that you can fall off the face of the earth like he had kept them going they've been to five straight ncaa tournaments like he had right. not just gone to a final four like he had kept them going to the tournament, kept them advancing, kept them in the, in the, in the national conversation. And so that was certain. And they, they changed leagues as well, going from the CAA to the Atlantic 10. And so it was certainly uh, an exciting, uh, exciting opportunity for me, but also a daunting task replacing somebody that had done uh, such a tremendous job. In uh, November, 2015, uh, VCU plays Duke at Madison Square Garden. Um, you're 33 years old. Uh, Coach K. Maschewski is 68. Uh, he actually started coaching at Duke two years before you were even born. <laughs> um, what did you learn from that experience of coaching against a Hall of Famer like him? Well, the first thing I remember is we got in at halftime. And I think it was a two point game. It was a relatively close game. And I remember thinking, all right, our team's pretty good. Like we've got a good team, no matter how this thing turns out, like we've got a, we've got a very good team, but uh, you know, in the moment, you don't really think about all that sort of stuff. I guess, looking back being 33 years old, coaching in Madison square garden with a great program like VCU against a, you know, one of the premier programs in the country like Duke. I, I mean, yeah, I probably should have been pinching myself a little bit more, but you try to 
stay in the moment. And, you know, we thought we had a good team. We thought we could win and we, we played really well. We had chances to win down the right. stretch. Um, we ended up, we ended up getting beat, but um, you know, I, I think that uh, it was uh, something probably that I didn't appreciate uh, as much at the time. I, I'm not one of those guys that stopped and smelled the roses very much. Um, having this time off uh, has helped me maybe appreciate some of the experiences, appreciate um, some of the, some of the, um, you know, some, some of the accomplishments probably quite a bit more than, a, than, than I would have when you're, when you're in the heat of the battle. But uh, that's certainly, I mean, you know, to coach it against coach K coach against Duke um, in that environment in Madison square, square garden, that young was, was is certainly unique and certainly something that, that, that I'll remember. But um, you know, like I said, it was really about being there for our guys and, and we, we, we played really well against a very, very, uh, very, very good team. Yeah. That game was close. I remember that game. I think Y'all maybe lost by seven or eight at the very end, but I mean, it was tight all the way through the game. So that was a fun game to watch. And how would you describe your style of coaching? You know, player centric, you know, we try to be all about the, we try to be uh, all about the the players. Um, you know, I, I got better as we went along. Um, I tried, uh, I was probably a lot harder on, people in public than I should have been early on. And then, you know, I started doing a lot of that behind closed doors and being a lot more positive in public about everything. I think that's the way you need, I think that's the way you need to be. You've got to, you got to grow and, and, and continue to continue to evolve and continue to improve. But, you know, really it's, it's, it, it's all about, it's all about the players. It's all about doing everything you can to serve them uh, to make sure that, um, you know, they've got, I used to say we need clear minds and fresh legs. Like we want their minds clear and we want their legs fresh so we can, so they can play their best. And um, like I said, you, you, you try to, I looked at each kid, like one of those old gym locks where there's a code and you keep spinning the, keep spinning the lock to, to, to you listen to it, to wait for it to click. So you, every kid's got a code and we didn't decode everybody, but, but we, we, we decoded more, more than our fair share. And if you could, you could figure out that code, you had a good chance of, of helping that person succeed. And if you could help them succeed, that would help the, uh, that, that would help our team succeed. You mentioned uh, Greg Graber earlier, and I know for seven years, your teams, you know, work with him, you know, in mindfulness. And one of your former players at VCU, Jordan Burgess said of Greg, he helps us to block out all the distractions. How did he do that for your teams? Oh, he did that for our teams. He did that for me. I mean, look, we had a lot of distractions going on the last, four or five years and just to be able to lock in and now, you know, and just, and just be able to, to focus in on what's important, which was our team and, and winning with our team and doing what we need to do. And so, like I said, you know, when I've looked back at Shaka smart uh, meditating with Rob Brandenburg and different guys in his office, and I thought it was crazy. And then two years later, I've got a guy teaching us meditation and breathing and he's got me meditating. And I used to breathe before the games and, um, you know, it really helps you focus in, stay in the moment. Our teams have been very good free throw shooting teams. Uh, we've been in the you know top three in the leagues that we've been in and free throw percentage for a long time. I credit a lot of that to the different breathing techniques, being able to ground ground ourselves when we go to the free throw line. And, and, and there's a lot of, uh, you know, Greg can explain all the science behind it. There, there, there's a lot of science behind all of that. And, right. Um, you know, just being rooted in a routine. And so I thought, um, you know, it was something that, that grew on me. It was something I wasn't originally all that, uh, all that into, but it's something that I've, I've become very, very into. And Greg's been a great resource for, for our teams through the years and for our players. I mean, there's some of our players that still, even after they graduate or go play professionally, where they're still in contact with him, uh, contact with him all the time. And he's a good guy. So he always, so responding back and, and, and staying, uh, you know, trying to help them, um, trying to help them as much as he can. How do you handle communication with uh, parents and guardians? That's funny. That's a good question. Um, probably as a head coach, I communicated more than most, probably as much as anybody with parents, parents and guardians. Um, my only rules were I wouldn't talk to them the day of the game, night after the game. So, if uh, I wouldn't talk to him night after the game, I wouldn't talk to him about anybody else, but their son. And if they wanted to meet in person, their kid had to be there. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't meet with just the parent or the guardian in person. It'd be me, the parent, the, the me, the parent and the kid. Um, those were my only rules. And outside of that, you know, I, I feel like you have to communicate. 
And, you know, I, I was very uh, upfront. I would give our, our, our team uh, responsibilities at the beginning of the year. Some people call them roles. I think roles are kind of sound like, oh, this is your role. That's like a suggestion. A responsibility is a little bit more, got a little more pop to it. Right. A little bit more like this is what you're going to do. So we give our guys responsibilities. And I would tell, I had a kid this year, uh, played for me at LSU. Um, and he wasn't thrilled with his playing time, but he ended up playing. Uh, he he basically, he played, I think, 14 minutes a game. And, you know, he said, look, coach, it wasn't, this was after the year and after everything happened. And we, we talked, I still talked to him a couple of times a week and, he said, coach, he said, you know, I, I wasn't thrilled with it, but he said, the one thing I appreciate about you is at the beginning of the year, you told me I was going to play 15 minutes a game. You told me that after we went through preseason, you gave me my responsibilities and you said you should expect 15 minutes a game. You played me 14. I think he averaged like 14, some change a game. He's like, he was right on what you, he said. I can't, I can do nothing but respect that, that you did exactly what you said you were going to do. And that this is what you thought. And this is what, this is what I ended up doing for the, for the year. Now he didn't like that. He was only getting 14 minutes a game. And if we'd have been back, he'd have played probably 30 minutes a game the next year. Right. But you know, when you're up front, you're, you, you tell them, Hey, this is what you're going to expect. And, 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 you know, it takes a lot of those issues out. And so, you know, I, I think um, I used to say this to our staff all the time, your success is going to be, directly correlated to the number of difficult conversations you can have each day. And so everybody likes to just pat each other on the back and have nice conversations. But, you know, those are not easy conversations to have when you tell a freshman who's, you know, or sophomore or five-star this or that, that, Hey, look, it's not going to go quite like how you think it's going to go. Right. And this is what we're going to do. And this is what I feel, but it's better to get that out of the way now. And then, and then you can, you know, you, it's a lot easier to manage uh, throughout the, throughout the course of the season. But we probably over communicated with the parents. I sent them video updates every Friday. I would text them video updates. And so they were very aware of kind of where everything was and, and, and where their, where their, where their folks were, but I would certainly meet with them, but I wouldn't meet with them to talk about anybody else. And I wouldn't meet with them in person without, without their, without the, the, their, their kid there. And I certainly wasn't going to talk to, cause we're all emotional on game night. So after a game, I'm emotional. My staff's emotional. The parents are emotional. The kid, everybody's. So we just need to chill out, calm down and get to the next day. And I'd certainly meet with anybody then. You're obviously a, a really strict taskmaster and you're, you know, you're very organized and you've been described as someone that, you know, really held his players accountable for their own actions. Why do you feel that that is so important? Well, I mean, like I said, show up on time, do great work. And so, you know, like I didn't have a ton of team rules, but I wanted you to be on time. Like, I think that's the ultimate sign of respect is if you're on time, that shows you respect everybody else on the team. That shows you respect their time. That shows some self-respect. So that was one of my big things was just, just be on, uh, be, be on time. And I think, you know, it's one thing to say, you know, you've got to be disciplined as the leader to have, you know, the guys that you lead be disciplined themselves. And so, um, you know, I, I try to live a pretty disciplined uh, lifestyle. I tried to be around the guys and be in the gym and, and be with them as much as, as much as I, I possibly, uh, I possibly, I possibly could. And I think, you know, if you're like that as a leader, I think sometimes that rubs off, uh, rubs off on the guys. And, and, you know, it got to the point where I was very non-emotional about, I used to, that's what I was talking about when I was at Chattanooga and, and, and kind of shifting at Chattanooga, I was very emotional with them. If I, if a kid was late or something happened, I, I mean, I just go ballistic because I thought it was personal to me. And, you know, it got to the point where, all right, you're late, you know, the consequences just go over there and get with the strength coach. And he knows, you know, he knows what to run you. You were this many minutes late. Like it, it became very non-emotional. Hey, it is what it is. You know, the consequences, you know what the deal is, just keep it moving. And when you do that and you have that, that discipline and that structure, it rubs off on the guys. I think, I think they eventually, uh, they eventually uh, come around. How do you balance, uh, understand balance between athletics and academics? Well, it's, you know, it's getting, it's getting harder and harder because the athletics is, is, is more competitive, but uh, really you've got to block the day out. So we gave academics a block from, you know, a, a six hour block or a five hour block during the day. And then we gave it a two hour block at night for, um, for tutoring and study hall and, and, and that sort of thing. And then and the basketball was in the other, the other blocks of the, uh, the, the other blocks of the day, but 
the end of the day, they are, they are student athletes. Not all of them are going to go to the NBA. And even the ones that do go to the NBA, there's certain, you know, there's certain classes, you know, a finance class or there, there's some other, there, there's some, there's some classes that are very, very important for their well-being, for their growth, for their ability to, to, um, you know, to, to, to have success and to, and, and to, and to not have to rely on, I used to tell them all the time with me, if you take this class, it could save you $80,000 in what you pay a consultant a year to go through your taxes or to go, you know, it can pay, you're not, you're not paying that much for taxes, but, but, you know, it could, for, for, for somebody to invest your, you know, you, you can, you can save a lot of money if you, if you, you know, on this class. And so, um, you know, I think it was important to, you know, I, I don't think we do a very good job explaining why we just say, go do this. Well, go take this class. Well, why, why do what they want to know? What, why is it useful? And so I, I tried to, you know, with my teaching background and my education background, with my family, I would try to explain the why behind, Hey, this is why this is important. This is why this is, um, you know, this could be beneficial to you down the road. What is a typical day like for a head basketball coach? <laughs> there is no typical day. Um, but, uh, you know, my days were usually I get going about 430, 445 in the morning. And then um, I'd get up, I'd, uh, I'd meditate, I'd read, I'd run. So I'd be done with that, depending on by 630 or seven. Then we'd have guys coming in the gym. Uh, we'd have guys coming in the gym from uh, seven to nine for their morning vitamins. And then nine to 1130, you know, would really be office work. Then we'd get to plan and practice and we'd have practice. Um, we'd have practice in the afternoon. Um, then after that, you'd have, you know, we'd have film to break down practice. And then after that, sometimes I'd have radio show, media, all sorts of all sorts of stuff like that in the afternoon. And then you go from there into recruiting and, and that sort of thing. So you, I, I try to end the day by 1030 or 11 and um, and get back up and, and go again. Uh, and go again, go again the next day. But it's, uh, yeah, it's a, it, they're fun days. Every day is different. There was always different things that, uh, that, that, that came up. I used to joke, I could get more done between 4.30 and 8 than I could between 8 and 4.30 because 8 and 4.30, there's just so much stuff going on. There's so many different, you know, um, many fires that you've got to put out to make sure they don't turn it. You know, you got to put out a little fire, make sure it doesn't turn into a brush fire. And so, um, you know, but I enjoyed that part. It's a lot, it's really about being able to, to manage issues, manage people, manage problems. Um, you know, you got to be able to, to, to be able to, um, operate with some sense of order within a chaotic, uh, you know, within, within chaos. Right. And so, you know, my, you got to embrace that and enjoy that. And, um, you know, we tried to, we tried to manage that the best we could every day. How did you and your wife Lauren meet? Uh, it's funny. We actually met through a mutual friend. Uh, one of my good friends was one of her professors uh, at Vanderbilt. She's a lot smarter than me. She got her graduate degree from Vanderbilt. And uh, she introduced us. And uh, I was a head coach at Chattanooga at the time, or I was an assistant at VCU at the time and become the head coach at Chattanooga. And so kind of went from there. But uh, yeah, it was a lifelong friend. Who has been the biggest influence in your life? Well, I mean, really you know, my father was a huge influence. He's a hard, hard worker to this day. He still works extremely hard. He's, he's in his seventies and still gets up at four 30 in the morning, four o'clock in the morning and runs and he's volunteers and does all sorts of stuff. And so he had a, he had a huge influence on me. I had a high school coach, David Muckle, who had a big influence, just a lot of people. And then all the coaches that I worked for from Tommy Amaker to Oliver Purnell to Shaka Smart. I mean, I, I had a, had a lot of people that have that have really really uh, invested in me and and I've tried to I've tried to pay that back with the people who worked for us you know and worked with us uh, whether it be the managers the trainers the uh, academic folks whoever it, you know I've, I had people that really helped me get going and, and we wanted to we wanted to try to pay that back as best we could. What do you do uh, enjoy doing during your downtime? Well, <laughs> we don't have a lot of downtime. I've uh, I enjoy to read. I've, I've been reading. Uh, I've been reading. Uh, I've been reading a lot. I enjoy the running. Uh, I've gotten into, you know, now I, I walk a lot during the day and, and make phone calls while I'm walking and moving around. And so, um, you know, I, I, I'm a pretty simple guy. I don't, I don't, I don't have a lot of 
exotic hobbies. I play a little bit of golf when I can. I'm not, I'm not, uh, not nearly as good as I want to be, but try to get out there and play a little bit of golf when I can, but it's been, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's really pretty, pretty simple days for me. What are the most important lessons that you've learned in life? You know, I'd say the number one thing and, and, um, you know, I, I, I tell, I told this, I, I'll give you two, yeah. you know, be consistent, be consistent. The best people are consistent people. I used to tell our team all the time, never bet against consistent behavior. The guys I trusted the most were the most consistent, the best people in your life are the most consistent. So I tried to be consistent. Uh, you know, I tried to be consistent every day and then, you know, be tougher than your circumstances. You got to be tough. So, you know, and I'm going through that right now. You got to be tougher in your circumstances. You got to practice what you preach. You got to be, a, you got to be tough. You know, everything's not going to be perfect all the time. Any, you know, anybody can operate in perfect conditions. If you can't operate in perfect conditions, you're just incompetent is the way I look at it. But who can operate and who can, who, who can make things happen when conditions are not tough? I mean, when conditions are not right and when conditions are not perfect. And that's what separates people that I think that are very successful from people that are mildly successful or not successful at all. And so, you know, be consistent, be tough. Uh, if, if, if you do those two things, you're going, you're going to, you're going to be pretty good in anything that you do. You know, well, I really appreciate you coming on today. It's, it's been such a pleasure to talk to you. I've heard so many great things about you from Greg Raber over the last seven years. Um, and, you know, I've worked with him too, with mindfulness training, and, and I could definitely say it, I know why it helped the team so much because it definitely helped me a lot too. No doubt. No, it's huge. And I appreciate, I appreciate you having me on. I'm Greg. I'm glad uh, Greg uh, connected us and uh, really appreciate your time. Thank you very much. And hopefully I can have you on again down the road. Sounds good. Thanks, Mike. Thank you very much.